in the beginning were both to rules the fiqh of priority. When of priority, you want to remember um, that the word fiqh, for example, and the priorities, there are general guidelines that, that regulate, well, what makes this more important than that? Why is this more important than than um, than that issue? And what are the what are the regulations to it? Um, we're in the we talk the general general um, evidences or the general let me say guidelines. That's going to be more more like a math style thing where we're going to be going into I would say universal. And universal maxims of laws. We're going to be talking about Islamic principles, just so that we would give you. It's not going to be very detailed, but it's going to be in detail so that we would understand where does segment two come from. Segment two. So this segment one, and plus that the 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 PowerPoint that I was showing, and then segment two this is going to be the packet that you have with you. Um, this is go. These are going. To, inshallah, we're going. To To be as done in boxes mm -hmm. in order to help us understand that webbing style especially for those that are visual learners we're going to talk about the details of a woman's life a woman's life with her husband with the children um, at home what comes what comes first and how is that even all designed uh, all designed when it comes to children what comes first in children's um, in children's issues and what goes second how do we deal with that and then when we speak about when we speak about the details of uh, the, the details of household how do we make that that how that our house a home how do we work out our priorities the class is going to focus a lot on issues that that uh, relate to married women specifically women with children um, women that are working women that have so many so many different things and especially women that are working working or even uh, living in the West just because there's so many there's so many different things that are required from you and you don't really get a lot of help from family mm -hmm. uh, as for example somebody that that lives in in, in, in different countries they would ding on that all and we'll also be talking about certain certain things that relate to feminism and right now the issue of women's rights and men's rights um, we'll be talk we'll be commenting on that as well and we'll be talking about the issue of mercy and love and how do we get that in when sometimes our life becomes very um, interwined where we're talking about rights and at the same time we're discussing discussing mercy and love does it vanish when we're when we're talking about our rights how does it how does it go so this is going to be segment three that part is going to be segment three and then in segment one um, we'll be discussing you could say the math behind these priorities and how they're designed so in segment one this is going to be segment one inshallah and we're going to be focusing generally on these powerpoints so um, to start when we say women's fiqh of priority um, women's fiqh of priority we're going to be taking every single word in order to explain it we discuss the issue of women what we mean and which women are targeted or which women um, are going to be um, uh, are going to be discussed in this class um, this study this study was was mainly a study that I I learned from a book for Yusuf al Qadlawi, Dr. Yusuf al Qadlawi. Um, but his his study was more working on the Islamic movements, and I claim that this is at least the from what I know I did not come across a women's fiqh of priority, uh, women's fiqh of priority study done yet. I did not come across something that that did it in in that webbing style. When we say fiqh, fiqh actually means to understand, and fiqh is a study. It's a science. When you say fiqh, you're actually discussing 
discussing the science that teaches or that is specialized in deriving rulings from the different evidences of Islam. The different evidences of Islam, so the different evidences of Islam include different details, different details that are that are mentioned in the Quran, for example, or Sunnah, or probably the words of the Sahaba, etc., and the list goes on and on. When we say fiqh, it's very important to understand that fiqh stands on evidences that are mainly textual evidences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taught the Prophet or were revealed in the Quran. In other words, it's not, it, uh, it's not dependent on what I think and what you think. It's not an issue of culture, it's not an issue of this is how I feel about it. Unfortunately, there are many out there that think that I believe Islam says this. Where did you get this from? And then they will have their own interpretation. It's not an own interpretation. No, you go back to Quran and Sunnah. It's not an interpretation that you invent. When we talk about priorities, we're talking about regarding um, regarding something some something maybe more important than another thing but of course when we're talking about islam it's very important to understand that okay now i'm going back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the the principles that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid out for me to understand how do i see the world how do i see the world how do i prioritize my responsibilities where do i as a woman stand in terms of all these different responsibilities around me and especially when we're looking at our lifestyle right now our lifestyle right now with women actually right now in engaging in working and engaging in a lot of the materialistic materialistic or let me say capitalist lifestyle that becomes very hard for us to understand how do i put my social lifestyle along with this capitalist lifestyle together and the motherhood, which is the social part of me. How do I put all these different things together? When we say priority, it means that they're all important, but something is more important than the other. When we say priority, we're actually talking about considering certain, we're considering certain things, at least this comes first. Don't miss out on that, and do less focus on the other part. What should my main focus be be on in terms of or in comparison to other things? Yes, I'm probably not doing a good job on that, but that's because I'm focusing on not, uh, on a certain priority. And this is something that we're all going to fall in. Remember, our responsibilities as women are are too many, and because they're too many, we have to understand how do we put and what comes first and inshallah with the webbing i'm telling you inshallah it's going to be very be beneficial and even the people that are online you will see the the web inshallah you will see the webbing and you will see you will have something visual for, for you to understand the, this lecture is going to be uploaded on youtube as well for records um and of course when when we talk about priorities when we talk about priorities, there's so many different things to do. For sure, you're going to be behind on certain things. There's no doubt that you're going to be behind on certain things. But on Judgment Day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and even in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask you to do more than what you can handle. But this class, inshallah, aims at understanding at least the most important things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want me to um, to be short on or to miss out on and think that okay I'm I'm doing everything. I want to understand what is the most important thing. Um, for example, unfortunately many women are focused on just making their houses clean and then not realizing that wait a minute did you look at your children? Did you teach your children? We're going to talk about how we work on, out, out that those priorities. The resources that this lecture stands on, number one, maqasid al-shari'ah, the principles of Islam. 
when I say resources, of course, there's the re- the general the general resources: Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, Qiyas, uh, the words of the Sahabi, the Al Istihsan, all these different things. But those are the the principles. Those are those are the principles. So I'm not going to here make it a fiqh of uh, or usul fiqh class or the principles of fiqh class. We're here just trying to understand the priorities and how they're laid out. All right, and how they're laid out. Number one is that maqasid al-shari'ah, the principles of Islam. What does that mean? We're going to talk about it in just a bit. Um, maqasid al-shari'ah, the principles of Islam, they also are derived derived from the Qur'an Sunnah. They're not just laying out like that. The other part, which is the general dhaqiyya, the general universal um, uh, laws in in fiqh, we're also going to talk about that. Now, scholars, scholars went and derived from the Quran and Sunnah the different rulings and laid them out in a canon style, a canon style to help us understand how we web different things in general laws. How we understand what does the Quran, what does the Quran tell us and the Sunnah tell us. In a canon style, which is what Islamic jurisprudence is generally is specialized um, is specialized in doing. The Islamic principles. Remember, we're going to now talk about okay the the resources that is the, that these fiqh priorities go back to. Number one, Islamic principles. The Islamic principles, or let me say, the Islamic laws or Islamic Sharia, stands on these the these five main principles: the preservance. And the safety of these five categories. Number one, deen, nafs, ird, aql, and mal. What are those? Deen, to preserve the spirituality and the piety of, number one, the community, two, the individuals. Two, nafs, people's lives, the community's lives, is a second is a second uh, priority Ird, preserving pe- minute, say yep. that again, for people's lives mm-hmm. the communities the communities uh, the, the general public mm-hmm. their life and also the individual's life so when they talk about sharia being being uh, a threat and terror and all that just understanding these islamic principles is a very important thing because Islamic Sharia stands on these five principles: mm-hmm. the preservance of people's spirituality, the preservance of people's lives, the preserving uh, preservance of people's chastity, the preservance of people's minds, the preservance of people's wealth. Mm-hmm. The resources of Islam. We talked about that. Um, uh, we talked about that. One thing. Do you mind going back? Yep, I can go back. Uh, this is actually in your packet right here. Okay. Yeah, it's right there. Um, the resources of Islam. When we say, for example, we go back to Quran, when we say we go back to Quran, um, or we go back to Sunnah, the, generally the hadith or the ayat are laid out, but then the scholars would read through these ayat and through these hadith, through these ay- ayat and hadith, and lay out what they derive the ruling. That is that that uh, that that are mentioned in in these um, different resources. Now, al qawaid al fiqhia. We're trying to go back uh, really fast so we can get to this. Al qawaid al fiqhia are basically the five universal maxims of Islamic law, and these five and they're right here in your packet. These five universal maxims of Islamic law. They're basically the five different categories that most of the, the, the rulings of fiqh go back to. Number one, that al-umur bi maqasidiha, that everything or matters are only judged by their objectives. Alright? Two, that harm shall be removed. Three, culture usage shall have the weight of law. What does that mean? Meaning even culture, if there isn't a text, 
acts as a resource in Islam. Is that why you make an example? Make an example. Let's say you sold me a house. Or let's do it in a woman's life. All right, in women's life. Um, a woman got married and then all of a sudden she discovered that um, she discovered that the house isn't there. The family, for some weird reason, didn't talk about it, didn't discuss where's the living going to be, etc. All right? He can't say, well, she was supposed to be living at your home. No, because culture, in culture, culture-wise, is that the man is supposed to provide the house. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now let's say something else. And then you would back up, back up the religious reason on, on the culture one that she has the culture, right to have culture, the place. Culture becomes a reference when there is no text, uh, when right. no te when there is no text mentioned in here. Well, this is of course the culture, the positive culture thing that is not against the Sharia. Once culture goes against or contradicts something in the religion, mm -hmm. we reject the culture. Okay, okay? we're talking okay. about a culture where the culture does not reject the religion. What happens when you have, like, for example, a lot of um, contradictory yeah. cultures? No, if a lot of stuff comes from like a lot of Arabic nations, and if you have an Arabic alum okay. who is judging, using the cultural judgment, Absolutely. using their own culture. That's a very, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. If when we talk about, for example, an Arabic alim use judging based on his, on his perspective. Number one is that there is, there's generally first there's the the text that they go back to that they're supposed to go back to in order to preserve to preserve the rulings from not necessarily being a personal opinion. All right. Number two is that that can happen when there is, when there is, let's say, a family dispute, when there's a family dispute that if you go to, let's say, a scholar that is an Arabic scholar and both couples are Somali, we would always say go back to the scholar that is from your community. Always. And so when people then say that, no, that's nationalism. No, it's not nationalism. Because al-'adatu muhakkima. Because culture is a resource. So when in case we have a dispute between a husband and wife, we would tell them to go back to the people that understand their culture to rule within their culture. In fact, in fiqh we say, الحكم على شيء فرعان عن تصوره meaning whenever you want to give a ruling on something it is actually branched from the way you, you perceive it you, the way you understand it so very important to actually go back go back to people that understand your culture but of course this is not to say that culture would be a reference over sharia yeah. Yeah. over islam no Culture would be a reference if Islam itself refers you to culture. Mm -hmm. If Islam refers you to culture. And, and this actually acts, as you could see right here, it actually acts as the third, one of the third laws. al mm -hmm. al It actually is it actually is considered. So even when a man wants to get married to a woman, for example, the way and the details of dowry and all those different things, a lot of it we would say, how do you do it in your culture? Mm -hmm. In order to explain it. Even when we talk about the details, is a woman supposed to is a woman supposed to be spending on the household mm -hmm. if she works? This is really important because the husband and the wife, they might go into dispute and and he might say, Well, you're supposed to pay half of what you make. And she'll say, no, I heard the sheikh say that um, I'm supposed to be not paying anything, even if I was a million dollar, um, even if I was a millionaire. There's actually different opinions between scholars on that. And the reason why scholars had differences of opinions on, on how much a woman would, would actually pay, there are actually seven different opinions on this. 
the reason why they had differences of opinions is really because there is no text that says if a married woman is working, then she will pay half of her income, um, third of her income, or whatever. Scholars had different opinions on that. The reason why is because every culture, every culture has a different perspective. In fact, even let's take the fiqh al-Maliki. Even in fiqh al-Maliki, there are different opinions in just one madhab on whether she pays half, whether she pays one third, or whether she pays uh, based on the agreement. In Hanafi madhab, it's based on the, the on, based on what they agreed on. All right, and that's why it's very important that when we look at this. When we look at this having that much weight in in fiqh, it's very important to do that marriage counseling before you get married in order to understand, okay, well, how do we understand some of the details? For example, money and how much I spend on it and how much I give from my, from my income and all that. Go ahead. Okay, this is a little bit harder question. What happens then when you have, say, a husband from one culture and a wife from one culture? When you have a husband and a wife from two different cultures, very distinctly different. Very distinctly different. Number one, generally, um, it's not about when we talk about marriage. Marriage is not about who has the right of say. Although Islam considers, we're going to talk about this later on. Islam does consider a rijal al-qawmuna al nisa that men have more the right of say. Not to mean when we say that men more have the right of say, it doesn't mean that he has the right to condescend her. It doesn't mean that. We're going to lay that out, inshallah, later on. But it would mean that he would be the decision maker, the final decision maker. And that's why I would usually recommend, not from my own personal experience, my husband is Tunisian. I'm part Palestinian not from my own personal experience but from my personal experience working with with people from different cultures and marriage and marriage counseling from with different cultures I usually recommend people to marry from within in their own culture because when you actually marry somebody outside of your culture you're going to have a lot of different understandings and a lot of a lot of barriers in understanding one another. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying that marriage working out. But I'm not saying it's impossible. But I would always recommend marry from within your culture because it is already hard enough to have the common grounds of understanding. In fact, I'll actually even go farther than saying marry from within your, your own culture. I would say marry somebody that understands your language and marry somebody that understands your new culture. If you grew up in America, marry somebody that grew up in America. This was, I have a question. So I'm yep. a convert to Islam. Mm -hmm. And so when you said uh, when you want to go to the scholar and go to someone that knows your culture, right. it was really hard to find an American scholar right here in the country. Absolutely. You know, so I... I went to like several different <laughs> chefs, you know, asking questions over the years of being married and, and with different situations that come up and it's like, who do you stick with? You know, which one? Well, let me tell you one thing. Although culture has a lot of weight in defining a lot of things in fiqh, but um, there are principles in Islamic law that we go back to. So it's not that they're inventing their own, their own Islam. All right, it goes back, and those are those are very few things. Right? Those are very few things. But generally, I would recommend uh, I would recommend seeing an, uh, a marriage counselor. The marriage counselor would help the couple understand how to work out their their disagreements. And right now, there are studies there that are there are studies on how to bring about the perceptions and the understandings closer. All right. So anyhow, we're we're going to talk about that later on. Um, hardship. Uh, the fourth one is that al-mashakatazlubutaisir. Hardship shall bring uh, alleviation. In other words, when things get harder, when things get they get harder, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not obligate something on you that you cannot handle. All right. Meaning for women, yes, the tasks are too many, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala 
understand, in understanding priorities and in understanding putting those in place, that's why Il Mashaqqa Tajlibut Taiseer. That's why when things get harder, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, focus on that first. That's your priority, focus on that, and the details would be details. Al Yaqeenu la yazuru bi shak, certainty shall be removed by doubt. So when you're in doubt about something, when you're in doubt about something, um, you go for what you're sure of. That, that's a, a lot of things to say. When we say leveled, levels of prioritization, this is very important to mention that in Islam, like there's darurat, necessities, and there's the hajiyat. Darurat would be the five, the, the preservation of the D-M-A-I-M that we mentioned, the deen, the nafs, the ird, the aql, the, uh, the, the aql, the ird, the mal, right here in the beginning. Uh, the needs, if missed, it will cause hardship. And the improvements, if tahsiniyat, luxury, uh, and completeness, no hardships, if missed. So we'll, we'll talk about that later on, inshallah. What is the le- legality, what is the evidence that in Islam there's that, priori- that prioritization um, system in Islam? Number one is that if you go back to the Qur'an, the Qur'an also has the pattern to tell us that the pattern of having something, that prioritizing pattern, is actually part of Qur'an or part of the pattern that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had considered as part of Sharia. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِّ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ كَمَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْأَخْرِ وَجَهَدَ فِي سَبِلِ اللَّهِ لَا يَسْتَوُونَ عَنْدَ اللَّهِ What does that mean? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is questioning the pagan Arab. Because they used to, they used to, brag and, and actually say that they're they're giving food, they're giving water, they're giving the pilgrims all these different, in other words, community service. They're doing the community service. All right? And in other words, they're good. They're helping the poor, they're helping all the people, etc. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, is that, how can you, in other words, say that a person that believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believes in Judgment Day, does that jihad for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equal to somebody that is doing community service? Community service is good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying community service is not good. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that that is not the priority. That is not the priority. The other part, or another A, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ what happened? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid that we would condescend or swear at the, their, uh, their idols so that in order to not have them swear at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The priority was to prevent the kuffar from bashing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if that meant leaving bashing their gods. Remember, if they would have condescended their gods, it would have probably could have been given a way to prevent others from worshipping those gods. Right? Because when you condescend their, their, their lifestyle, it could have been a way of quote-unquote da'wah. Right? right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no, don't do that type of what you might think it's da'wah because it might actually bring harm and then having them swear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a response, to, a response to ISIS too. Right? You don't attack, you don't attack even the Muslims, and then have even a bigger attack on Muslims. Or even get more people out of Islam, thinking that, oh, I'm making people practice. Um, the other hadith, Evidences from the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ actually said that the best siyam, that afdul siyam, after Ramadan, the best siyam is the siyam of Shahrullah al Muharram, month of Muharram. What does that mean? That there's the priority having fasting Shahr Ramadan, fasting the pillar. Even if you even if you fasted all the all the year. 
that does not equal fasting Ramadan. The other part is that the Prophet ﷺ actually was asked, which is the best action after, uh, which is the best action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, favors, and the Prophet ﷺ said, praying on time. And then he was asked, then what? And then he said, Birrul Walidain, being good to your parents. Then he was asked, then what? And he said, doing jihad fi sabirillah. Now what does that mean? That in Islam, there are different levels. There's another story. Is that the munafiqeen during the battle of Tabuk, the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they, they were plotting against the Prophet ﷺ. And then Ubayy ibn Salul actually said, that he's going to expel We're going to expel The best of them And the worst of them Out of Medina Now some of the Sahaba Thought well Because of what he said Why don't we just bring an end to him But the Prophet ﷺ said That he was fearing That it was going to be said Muhammad is killing his friends Why? Because there is the priority he regarded what the media might say about the Prophet ﷺ and getting people afraid of Islam as a, as a priority over stopping Ubay ibn Salud from attacking the Prophet ﷺ. Alright? Now, and when, we, when we talk about prioritization, it's about balance. It's about getting the level of balance. Because remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentions, وَبْتَغِ فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا And consider, in other words, make your priority doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered you to do for the akhirah. But don't forget, don't forget your share in this dunya. It's about balance. Can you say it again, well, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you on judgment day. And don't forget your share in this dunya. That's Surah Al-Qasas, Ayah 77. In other words, being religious does not necessarily mean that you only pray and you only pray and you only do rituals, but you actually do the balance. On the other, on the other hand, some Sahaba, Anas ibn Malik, actually mentioned that the three men came to the Prophet ﷺ and they, they actually came to ask about the rituals of the Prophet ﷺ and how he was practicing his religiosity or his spirituality. So the first one actually said that, um, that they pray all night. And the second one said that they fast uh, all days. And then the third one said that he stays away from women, meaning that never gets married. And the Prophet ﷺ told them that, no, it's about balance. It's about balance, and that even though he is a prophet, but he prays and lives a normal life, fasts and also does not fast other days, and also gets married. Certain guidelines for prioritization, this, is, this, this part is really important, but we're going to go over it really fast. Obligatory actions precede recommended and liked actions. So when we talk about uh, general rules of having one, one action more important than another action, you want to remember that it's about first regarding the obligatory things and then regarding the details, sunnah, etc. Seeking high virtues precedes other less important virtues. That's Straightforward. Concealing rituals precedes revealing them. Continual or continual daily actions precedes the intermittent actions. Right? Of course. Consistent deeds. The things that you do on a daily basis are more important. Your child's schooling is more important than a soccer game. Right? We're going to go more into that. Islamic creed precedes sharia. This is a very important thing. 
when we say Islamic creed precedes Sharia. Sharia is more in when we say Sharia here, we're actually talking about actions and rulings. All right. So rulings. You know what? Why don't you take my coat? No, no, it's just my hands are alive. Okay. I have my photos. Um, when we say Islamic creed, we're talking about aqidah, the, the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believing in the prophets, believing in the messengers, believing in, in the yawm al-akhir, believing in the malaika, believing in the Qur'an, etc. All those would make up al-aqidah. Sharia would be the details. Is she wears my daughter wearing hijab? Is she struggling with her hijab? How's, what are those where should we put that on the map? What's a priority? Aqidah comes first. We're, we're, this is just laying out, you guys. We still didn't even start. All right? Um, ease precedes hardship. In other words, make it easy and don't look for harder things. I've had a number of um, women. They would become Muslim and then she's in a hurry to wear niqab and wear... wear um, uh, you know, c consider all the different details of uh, bid'ah and all that, and then all of a sudden, drops out because she went very hard. Take it easy. Take it easy. In the heather din fa fihi When you convert, it also depends on the community that you're around. Absolutely, absolutely, it depends on the community that you're around. They're telling you here's what you have to do. Absolutely, the common benefit precedes the less benefit, of course. الأكثر مصلحة أولى بالتقديم من الأقل مصلحة. Common benefit meaning the more benefit, the things that you need more. Considering the bigger harm is prior to the lesser evil. That's why Islam, um, considering the bigger harm. So when we look at the Prophet ﷺ, a man came to the masjid, and what did he do? He actually urinated in the masjid. What did the Sahaba do? They wanted to kill him. They wanted to, <laughs> they wanted to attack. But the Prophet ﷺ said, "Da'uh, wadnu alayhi the nuban min al-mat." Just bring a bucket of water. What was the guy's response? Ya Allah, get me and Muhammad al jannah and don't let anybody else in. <laughs> Why? Because he was attacked. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, even us as uh, mothers, you know, when we're potty training our kids, we're worried they're going to be the floor, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But we'll see you right now, inshallah, when it comes to... Yeah, I'm serious. It's like, oh my God, don't pee in the muscle. Let me run to the bathroom. <laughs> Continued and wide benefit <laughs> is precedent over temporary and narrow benefit. Continued and wide benefit, like the continuous actions, when we look at the actions, what... Uh, we still get, didn't get to the real butter yet. Um, yeah, I don't think yeah. we have that. Yeah, no, you guys don't have that. Um, we, when we get to the continued benefit, like the benefit that is continuous, that comes over the temporary and narrow benefit. Continued benefit, and this is something very important. Many girls will tell me, oh, I, I, I want to, I want to go for, let's say, do my internship and she would get like let's say a, a good proposal all right but she wants to she's so excited about the internship that she doesn't want to think about this good proposal that she's getting and here we would say continued and wide benefit is precedent over the temporary and narrow benefit what is that marriage is continued that's a life matter. Yeah. That you should consider more over a narrow and a temporary benefit, which is that internship that you're, or this job, this temporary job that you have. Why would you consider it a temporary job? Maybe it's a life job. But Maybe marriage is a life, years. it's a you life matter. Yeah. But marriage is a life matter. So you Maybe at least look into the time. proposal. At least look into the proposal. You see what I mean? Instead of saying, okay, well, right now, this, this internship, it, and this is something a lot of times girls don't realize. And this is the pressure of femis, feminism and pressure American of society, right? the, the American society, and where it's kind of regarding that, 
for example, maybe it is. Maybe some women, they don't. To them, marriage is, is not a priority. But if she considers, or let me say, if she is in a need to get married, because marriage comes in five different rulings. Halal, haram, right? Wajib, mubah, right? And makruh. Comes in five different rulings. If she's in a state where she's fearing, fearing haram on herself, then that would be continued and wide benefit. She has to look into it. She has to look into it. She's obligated to look into it. And it becomes even a bigger priority and a, a, a bigger priority than even her college degree. If she's in a, in a state of fearing haram, fearing, fearing haram or probably thinking that she might be in a fitna. Um, the other part that brings the other question is a woman's life centered around her private life more than her the public arena or her public life? Is this question imposed on us through feminist movements? Is the Muslim community now being influenced by non-Muslim secular resources to change its interpretation for Islam? These are important questions to ask. Because, unfortunately, right now, let me get up for this one. Unfortunately, right now, we're not realizing that the feminist movement, that the feminist movement is actually pressuring a lot of our girls and pressuring the Muslim community and pressuring women in general to look at, the, to look at marriage life and to look at the relationship between men and women as if it's a relationship as they view it from the Darwin theory that it's a struggle for survival or it's a struggle of the fittest. So unfortunately right now our homes are starting to be using that concept, are starting to use that concept as if the wife is in a, in a struggle with her husband and our homes became rather than a home, more of a battle or a jungle. That she's trying to, because it's the struggle of the fittest, so she's trying to somehow somehow fight for her right. Look at this this lexicon that is being used. Fight for her right. Rather than rather than let's do it as uh, it's supposed to be Mawadda wa Rahma. We're gonna get there in Shalma. It's not fight for your right. It's supposed to be a home, not a battle and not a jungle. The concept is infiltrating the minds of a lot of our a, a lot of a, a lot of within the Muslim community even where it's it's a fight that's not the concept of Islam we're going to talk about it later on inshallah and unfortunately right now we're getting a lot of people even saying that there's islamic feminism nonsense <laughs> what is islamic feminism <laughs> is there misogyny that was practiced at one point yes but we go back to Islam in order to go back to get a divine resource with a prophetic interpretation. We go back to Quran in order to get a divine, a divine resource. In order to understand the world based on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world. And it's not a jungle. It's not a fight. It's not a fight. We're going to talk about this later on, inshallah. And right now, and it's so sad that right now there are many people actually bring in the new interpretation in Islam. Ma anzallahu biha min sultan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala generally, to, to answer some of the questions, is a woman's life centered around her private life? Is this question imposed on us through feminist movements? Is the Muslim community now being influenced by non-Muslim secular resources to change its interpretation for Islam? To answer the question, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid out a pattern, uh, laid out a pattern in this creation. And always the word la yastawi, for example, al-a'ma, kul basir, the blind is not equal to the person that is, the, the, the person that is capable of seeing. The people that know are not equal to the people that don't know. 
always that pattern is laid out in order to tell us that the pattern of difference or in afdal or having something that tafadul not al afdal but it tafadul that one may have certain things and the other one does not have is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created as a pattern in this world when would they be equal on the things that they are equal in so in muslim muslima religious part she's equal to him jannah is for a salih a saliha and a salih al mu'minuna wal mu'minatu ba'dhum awliya ba'dh and awliya means what awliya support and awliya can also mean authority all right so if we say al mu'minuna wal mu'minatu ba'dhum awliya ba'dh believing men and believing women they're supporters or authority over one another now when we actually say when we talk about equity they are equal men and women are equal in the things that they are equal in muslim muslim salih salih they'll get the jannah all right but when it comes to responsibilities in this world when it comes to responsibilities and rights they would differ because each one is different than the other a woman is different than the man and the man is different and because they're physically different psychologically different the responsibilities and their social responsibilities are different as well and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa qarna fi buyutikunna buyutikunna wa la tabarrajna tabarruj al-jahiliyyah al-ula generally allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayah in surah al-ahzab and that was more directed at the wives of the prophet sallallahu but when we say it's directed at the wives of the prophet sallallahu it does not mean that we don't take them as an example this laid out a pattern of piety what does the pattern of piety look like if it's on the wives of the prophet sallallahu well it should also include us as well now here wa qarna fi buyutikun allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually tells the wives of the Prophet sallallahu and qarna to have qarira like to dwell dwell in your own homes wa la tabarrajna tabarruj al-jahiliyyah al-ula and do not expose your beauty your your beauty the way that during the pre-prophetic era they were exposing in alusi who was a scholar uh, there are actually different alusis but this 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 is the scholar of tafsir he wrote um, a book called ruh al ruh al ma'ani ruh al ma'ani it's a, it's a book of tafsir and in his book he mentions that this is on um, all the qira'at on all the variant readings that this order is for the wives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and plus for all the women all the muslim women to take as an example in other words In other words when we talk about women when we talk about women it is in Islam it regards that women going in public is not is supposed to be the exception and not and not supposed to be the 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 general rule So in public okay. in public when we say in public remember the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says inna al-mar'a 'awra women are aura aura meaning private it's private which is supposed to be covered and not exposed fa idha kharajat min baytiha tashrab shaytan once she gets out of her home shaytan then then um accompanies her accompanies her not necessarily accompanies her to in a condescending thing where she's always with a shaytan somewhere no nope. that the people the outside the public men once they see her that's when they start trying to get uh trying to get um somehow a uh, a hold of her or trying to somehow to somehow um dishonor her or do something that will that will harm her so well, the prophet sallallahu the prophet sallallahu was laying this out 
and at the same time, Islam considered that there are regulations for women going in public. If there weren't any regulations for women, for women to go in public, then there wouldn't be a reason for the regulations. You guys understand what I mean? The regulations were there in order to say that women are allowed to go in public. Women are allowed to go in public and the hadith would be talking about the women that do not regard the their regulations. So the meaning of hijab, for example, and the, the, the regulations that speak about hijab and for example um, uh, for example when we talk about um, preventing or when we when we talk about um, not having the women, for example, intermingle with men and all that, that would be what the hadith is referring to, which is that, that would be the part which that hadith would be referring to, which is that when women go out, the shaitan is, is accompanying them. Not that women have a shaitan with her. Go ahead. Um, some people use um, from the of Maryam, right, you know, Jealousy, from Maryam. They use that, he said, uh, there was once a time when women only leave their home for three instances. That's actually, a, that's actually, um, that's actually a weak hadith. It's actually, not a weak, in fact, it's even made up. But yeah, isn't it not, isn't that just his opinion too? Like, isn't okay. this the real for that? Okay, so or let me tell you one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's, it's, it's not that a woman <coughs> must only leave, or the, the good woman must only leave, uh, like leave her house only for the grave or her to husband's, yeah, yeah. Or her husband's home. This is actually a maldua. This is actually a maldua, meaning fabricated, not weak, but fabricated. How could they spread that around? Okay. I've well, you want to you know, let me let me tell you one thing. Misogyny, misogyny was something that is is something that is prevalent internationally. It's not just in the Muslim world. It's an international thing. Misogyny. Because it was prevalent, because it was prevalent internationally, you are going to have, just as people had fabricated a hadith um, talking about, for example, uh, the, the, maybe the, the, the Khalifa himself, just to gain some favoritism from the, from the government, you're going to have people trying to gain manhood by condescending women. So you will get people fabricating a hadith that regard women as nothing or regard women as um, cannot leave the house and that type of patriarchy. It did exist. But the most important thing, even though it did exist, it does not necessarily mean that we're not able to distinguish what Islam or let me say the authentic interpretation of Islam and what Islam really says. So I'm, I'm asking because what you just said of like the fact that there are guidelines in the real or the fact that you can go out. If, if oh, you absolutely. Could go out, there would be no reason for guidelines if you were just supposed to leave, stay in your house for being born in your marriage and your death. That this is then the real. Oh, absolutely. So absolutely. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid out the guidelines for leaving. In fact, there's a hadith where, um, well, where you're not even supposed to prevent the woman from going to the masjid. All right? Now, but at the same time, another hadith, that they should only go not fragrance, meaning not having perfume, meaning what the details, not to say, okay, she can have uh, f- perfume. She can she cannot have perfume, but she can go out without hijab. Mm-hmm. If going to the masjid requires these conditions, how is it with going to work? Mm-hmm. Right? If going to the masjid requires these conditions, going to work requires these conditions even more. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Um. You, you know, regarding the explanation of this hadith, would you back up your uh, ruling or guidelines according to the culture, or not? Say that again. Say that again. Let's see in here. I mean, you can say, I mean, that woman should stay home all the time. Okay, I'm not saying women should stay home all the time. We're here saying that there's, um, there's, let me say, al-asl, and there's al, there's al-asl. Al-asl to mean al-ada, to mean al-ittirad, meaning a common thing. 
when we say al asal that the general rule is that Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على السلام حي على السلام حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Alright, so when we say الأصل when we say al-asal, we're talking about in the original stance. Alright, in the original stance, that generally a woman is not supposed to be wandering around in public as a man generally is in public. You understand what I mean? When we say that al-asal, qarar al-qarar fil bayt, it doesn't mean that she cannot be a doctor. But it would mean if she is a doctor, then she would be considering the regulations in hijab, considering the regulations in um, in um, in behavioral hijab. We're going to talk about that later on, inshallah. We're going to start with something. Thank you very much. Okay. What I mentioned, I thought it was Imam al Jazi's like, opinion, or what did was it a is it a weak hadith? No, it's, it it's, it's, it's no, it's a weak hadith. Oh. It's fabricated, not mm-hmm. weak. Mm-hmm. It's fabricated. Yeah. But Ibn al-Jawzi was one of the people that 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 quoted it. Yeah. Okay. okay. That makes sense. He that quoted it. Not opinion. that he made and it up. No, no. Okay. Ibn al-Jawzi was a scholar. He yeah. would not make up a hadith. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, Ibn I thought Jose, it was a commentary. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. He would not make up a hadith. He mm-hmm. quoted that. Okay, okay. Right. He quoted yeah. that. Ibn al Jawzi is a great scholar. Yeah. Tafsir, right. Tafsir, he's yeah. he's a great scholar. Yeah, yeah. But he quoted that. Mm-hmm. Not that he made up that hadith. Mm-hmm. There are so many fabricated yeah. ahadith. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I never meant it as like something against no, no, Jersey, uh, but He just quoted it? Well, yeah, I just thought it was like, not uh, not even Sahih al Bukhari, it's very fun. Like, any, like, incorrect, you know, like, I'm just saying, like, this person, this is automatically correct without me practicing it. Bismillah ar-Rahman 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 ar
Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Sami'allahu liman hamida. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allah wa Akbar Sami'allahu liman hamida Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Sami'allahu liman hamida Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا للسلاح هيا للفلاح قد قامت سلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر
Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Alright, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now we're going to continue, inshallah. Let me just comment on one thing. Um, we're restarting. Just comment on one thing. You had mentioned that Ibn al-Jawzi, Ibn al-Jawzi um, mentions, um, for example, that a woman should not leave unless she's going to her grave and, and all that. It wasn't just Ibn al-Jawzi. Um, Ibn al-Jawzi did not fabricate the hadith. Just wanted to say that. Um, but he quoted... Um, he quoted the words uh, that were that were considered as fabricated hadith. Now, having that being said, there were many fabricated hadith that were very misogynist, and some of them are very disgusting too. Um, but we are still able, and that's not what I'm basing when I said when I said that women generally are supposed to be. Are their 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 place their nat their normal place is really at home, not in public. I'm not basing it on that fabricated hadith, right? I'm basing it on the ayah. That's at least number one. I just brought up that one right? because, like, what you were saying is perfect. Yeah. The real about that, and I've been no. saying that one a lot. Yeah, like, and media. like I said, that even though it's mentioned in the context of the the, the wives the wives of the Prophet mm -hmm. but it still is considered, it still is considered that we're supposed to be taking them as an example. When I say that women are their first place is home. Their first place is home. That actually comes even with the understanding of, with the with the concept of hijab. That doesn't mean that they are not to be professors. They are not to work outside, etc. But this is to say the priority. All right, that the priority is her home, and then the details comes as if if she is capable of considering her hijab, considering that she is safe then she can leave. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about a priority. Priority is home. Your priority is to stay safe. A woman's priority is to stay safe. A woman's priority is to be, um, is to be um, in a place where she's honored. Mm -hmm. But once she goes public, she can go public if she regards the different regulations of going public. As 
Another example, for example, I'm not basing what I just said on a non-authentic hadith, which is when a servant to Yazid ibn Sakan asked the Prophet وسلم, and she said, well, men, uh, the, the hadith actually has, I'm just going to uh, summarize it because it's, it's a long hadith, where she she said, well, we're taking care of the children, we're doing, um, you, that is the men doing, the jihad doing all the different things, what about as us? And the Prophet وسلم, have you said, have you heard a woman that is, uh, that is, uh, that is better in asking the question about her matters of her faith better than this woman and then he told her go in sarfi ayatuha al-mar'a like go uh, woman and tell all the women uh, tell all the women that the that if a woman is good to her husband and seeking her uh, seeking him be, to be content and that that is equal to all what men do this hadith is daif. Okay. It is. This hadith is daif. But having it daif does not necessarily mean that other hadith, other hadith um, support that a woman generally is supposed to be considering obeying her husband and doing the details. We're, we'll talk about that later on, inshallah. Muslim women can be in public if public regulations are considered. Number one, talk about hijab. And two, behavior, hijab in behavior. Lowering the gaze, serious talk, reduce intermingling with men, and it's not. And if it's not affecting her priorities at home, if it's not affecting the priorities at home. Now, the priorities in a woman's personal life: number one, considering self-piety before others. So, in other words, you consider self, meaning your own your own self and your family's piety before you consider public's piety this is not just what do you mean public piety like you don't go make da'wah mm -hmm. outside when your own children need you to teach them yeah activism right, right? of course public speaker but exactly kids no. are thrown your, in daycares yep oh yep your home know. is your number of priority you don't go and okay, I'm a doctor, and but my kids, yeah. for example, are in daycare, yeah. or probably not getting the the the, yeah. the the help that they need, and we'll talk about the help that they need sure. later on. Or, for example, considering self piety, you consider your own your own piety, your own islah, not just piety. But generally, the the issues that relate to your own self mm. are a priority before you even start wanting to help others. So, for example, if you want to do good things, well, start with your husband. Start with yourself mm -hmm. before you say you want to do community service or help out and volunteer here and there. Religious. Um, religious and livelihood support starts with those that you are responsible, uh, that you're responsible for, and then expands to others. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Wabdat biman ta'ud," and start. In other words, whether it's religious or even financial support, it starts with your own family first, and then expands to others. You don't, you you don't donate if your own family is in need. Again, this is just really fast, okay? Um, from the maxims of uh, maxims of Islamic law, is that uh, considering Islamic creed, we mentioned that one. Prioritizing obligatory over Sunnah, considering people's rights over Allah's Taala's rights. You don't steal to pay for a donation. Of course. All right. Taqdim al maslaha al al maslaha al Considering communities' rights over personal. This is considering communities' rights. مصلح العمل مقدم على المصلح الخاصة communities rights meaning in public for example when we talk about when we talk about public safety alright we talk about public safety even though you can't say okay well, I want to have the freedom to drive the way I want no we, we consider communities safety as a, as, as a priority this is just an example of course removing harm precedes bringing benefit Proceeds bringing benefit. I know I spelled that wrong. Uh, removing harm proceeds bringing benefit. You're talking like the hood. Like you uh, Removing harm proceeds bringing benefit. 
and that's why it's very important that I remove the harm within my family for example if they're facing hardship or the having <coughs> fixing my, my kids aqidah for example that's a bigger harm than trying to say okay I want we need to get a better house for for the five thousand dollar home for example or let me give an, another example removing harm proceeds bring benefit many are willing to pay high mortgage than put their children in Islamic schools yeah. right of removing the harm that they're good they're getting because of being in public school is a priority over bringing a benefit when it comes to getting a, and paying all this mortgage many will tell you I can't pay for an Islamic school but they're being they're, they're paying lots of money for mortgage or even expensive car yeah. or even public private uh, like private schools over Islamic private schools right of course like a regular international school and priorities in spirituality number one priorities in spirituality Al-Aqidah comes first Oh, it's Islamic creed, the person's faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, faith in the... We mentioned that one. The Prophet ﷺ actually said, لَا تَدْخُلْ جَنَّةَ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا Jannah, you cannot enter Jannah unless you believe. The Prophet's, the Prophet's way and the Prophet's manhaj or the Prophet's method was always in first instilling aqidah in, inside the, the ummah. وَمَا أَصَلَّ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ إِنَّا لُوحِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ Every single prophet and messenger that was sent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him the revelation that there's no God worthy of worship but He. That is the first stance. At the same time, the Prophet ﷺ A sahabi um, said, Kunna ma'an Nabi That we were with the Prophet Fityanan hazawa. We were young, we were young guys, still youth. Fata'allamna al iman, qabla nata'allam al Quran. The Prophet or they, the Prophet taught them faith before they even learned the Quran. This is really important because a lot of times with kids, they're just working on teaching the kids the Qur'an and memorizing the Qur'an but the kids are not having their questions answered and this is something that all communities do unfortunately that they want to focus or even focus on having the girl to wear hijab when it doesn't even instill within her faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what comes first ثُمَّ تَعَلَّمْنَا الْقُرْآنَ فَنَزْدَادُ بِهِ إِيمَانًا so they they first, the Prophet ﷺ first taught them Iman, first taught them faith. Before he would even teach them the Qur'an. And because they learned faith before they learned the Qur'an, when they learned the Qur'an, learning the Qur'an was increasing their faith. It was on time. It was putting everything in place. فَإِنَّكُمُ الْيَوْمَ تَعْلَمُونَ الْقُرْآنَ قَبْلَ الْإِيمَانِ He said, you guys are learning Qur'an before you even... Learn the iman. What happens? You basically lose it because you didn't even you didn't even have it in place. The other part, islah al qulubi muqaddam ala a'mal al jawara. Having the spiritual correction comes precedent or comes before working on the details of halal haram. Go ahead. Let's say if you have a just a hunger in correction, is it why do we always say you need to work for that first? That's wrong. That's wrong. Of course. I don't. I don't want to say that when a when a person becomes Muslim, I w- I wouldn't necessarily say the last thing is to put on hijab. All right. That that's we don't necessarily say the last thing is to put on hijab, but. إِنَّ هَذَا الدِّينَ مَتِينٌ فَأَوْغِلُ فِيهِ بِلَهِ This Islam is a, is a solid religion. You don't start with everything taking everything all at once. And we're going to look at, in, in just a bit, see some, some things, 
If you look at this hadith for as an example, مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِلِ مُخْتَلَفِهِمْ عَلَى أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ Leaving forbidden matters precedes doing obligatory matters. In other words, first let her work and mentor her to leave, for example, the, the haram lifestyle that she's living and it starts with the kaba'a. The, the, the major sins. Don't start with the, ma- the, with the minor sins. You mean the, the major? Major the sins. The major sins? Major sins. Before the obligatory or just any? Major sins so before the obligatory. Sins. Before the obligatory. Yeah. I mean, like, for example, like, there are some. Like, for example. Who will say something like, uh, the brother. Uh, I mean, I've never heard someone say this, but like, the brother swears his salat will not be accepted. He shouldn't That's even bother true. with salat until no, he can fix himself. Someone no, no, you know, no, will say not, that. So no, that, his that, salat that, will correct him. That's not a... No, that's not right. Instance, what you're no. His salat will correct him. Even if they are doing major sins, mm-hmm. salat is a pillar. Yeah. All right? But when we say leaving forbidden matters, leaving forbidden matters comes prior to doing the obligatory things. Meaning, for example... When we're talking about mentoring people, it starts with helping them, helping them leave the, uh, the leave the major sins, for example. Leaving major sins like leaving drinking or zina, etc. Leave that, and that will give them that support in order to go up the ladder that that, that ladder of iman gradually. Not to start out with qiyam al Tell them, oh, do Qiyam al-Layl and it'll help you leave that. It might help them leave Haram. It might. But leave and work on work on leaving the Muharramat, the major sins, and that will bring in bring in the Iman. All right? Um Ifara'at Qabla Sunan wa Nawafa. When you want to do, when it comes to priorities, prioritizing the fara'ah. So you don't stay up late at night doing qiyam al layl and miss out on salat al fajr. Right? Mm-hmm. All right. And at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ actually forbid women from fasting if that was going to let her husband, let her husband. For example, if he wasn't if he wasn't ready for her fasting, right? Even though she's doing something a sunnah, but obeying her husband is obligatory, mm. and being there for her husband is obligatory. Um, there are so many different d- different regulations, but I'm just going to go over it really fast. Um, even though there's so many important things here, um, when it comes to com- community considerations when we're looking at what should I consider as a, as a priority um, it first comes meaning considering the benefit that you are sure of comes precedent over the benefit that you are not sure of and we're, we're going to talk about those in detail in just a bit inshallah تقديم المصلحة الكبيرة على المصلحة الصغيرة the big benefit and comes precedent is precedent over the smaller benefit. تقديم مصلحة الجماعة على مصلحة الفرد. The family benefit, for example, for example, the group benefit is more important than the family than the personal benefit. Let me give you an example for family. For example, when we say that الكبيرة على الصغيرة. For example, when the communities are family, the benefit for our family, financial benefit, for example, one of my children wants a toy, the wife, the, the we, for example, all right, he wants the we, and I know that he's got, most of his brothers can't focus like him, all right, and you can't control the we, so that way you'll say, you know what? Me having three of his brothers, they can't focus if I had that. Or teenagers that I can't control, 
if the we was in, was at uh, was in our house would be more important to consider than that um, nine year old boy who I can control to not use the we. So the best thing is to do what, not get it because of the bigger benefit. As an example. تقدم المصلحة الكثرة على المصلحة القلة. We mentioned that one. Um, considering the core over appearance. Considering the core over the appearance. The principle. إن الله لا ينظر. The Prophet ﷺ said, إن الله لا ينظر إلى أجسادكم ولا إلى صوركم ولكن ينظر إلى قلوبكم. Considering the core over the appearance. A lot of times, people are focusing on the appearance or focusing on yeah my daughter's wearing hijab but she's struggling with her Islam why? because we're focusing more on the appearance rather than focusing on the aqidah raising them with aqidah answering the question um, omitting evil is priori prioritized over bringing fingers now generally evil is different is in different ways. Remember this one? Right here? So the evil, we look at the deen nafs ghird aqal mal. Alright, let's look at it. I'm gonna take it for you guys. Can I mention something? Yep, sure. Um so I was training I was gonna get talking about conduct and stuff like that. So I've been Muslim for ten years now and when you talk about the outside appearance opposed to the inside appearance, like alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for me to wear hijab. But until now, I struggle with my brain. Changing my whole mindset of the way you used to think to the way you're supposed to think as a Muslim. You know, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. You know, unfortunately, Jamila, I, I love the fact that you actually brought that up. Sorry, you I'm said sorry. Yes. No, no, I love the fact that you brought that up. I'm going to therapy to get through this. Bags of hijab, and I was more than happy to wear them. Yeah. And I never had a problem with it. But I was still successful on making shuk, and no one taught me what shuk was. You know, I didn't know what he was until a couple of years ago. Um, and I eventually moved away from that naturally, alhamdulillah, but I was still making shuk. I still read, like, that, that kind of thing. No one told me that was shuk. Right. And not a, not one you know, time. unfortunately, I, you know, I would want to blame a lot of a lot of different uh, a lot of different areas why um, many actually many actually leave Islam because the community is more focusing on the outside and the appearance than actually fa focusing oh, yeah. on the when inside. And unfortunately, the masajid. I mean, this I must admit, I do feel that the masajid are are not doing their job in in teaching Islam, in teaching even the the seerah, for example, the life of the Prophet or the the miracles of the Prophet or or Islam or the details of Islam. Not to mention that it more you would see more of khutab al um I would say bashing women for not for example wearing hijab uh, than actually correcting aqidah or something in, in in the creed, or talking about um, talking about Islam and how the miracles of the Prophet or even bringing me closer to Islam. Unfortunately, this is this is something that you uh, that you always see in in our masajid. And unfortunately, even even as women, I think they women have a bigger struggle than men because even getting their questions answered one on one. Yeah. Very it's very hard. <laughs> That's what I said. It's very which hard. Do you go the, the, which shift do you go to? How do you contact? How do you contact? Yeah, where is he? And <laughs> even when, even when you sit with the sheikh, the sheikh, you know, is always, you know, somewhere up there. I'll tell you guys a very funny thing. All right, um, this is really funny. Um, my, when I used to study in the Islamic, you know, Islamic university. All girls had a very utopian, very utopian, this is real, very utopian understanding of Islam. Very utopian. Unlike the guys, they didn't have this utopian understanding of Islam. So, in the girls, one of my professors actually used to make fun of us. And used to say that, 
when a guy would go and ask for the girl's hand, she's all of a sudden speaking in Fusha. Did she think that being religious actually means you speak in Fusha? <laughs> and guess what? I wasn't myself. I wasn't um, uh, myself. I was not, what is the word that I should use? But I wasn't immune to this utopian understanding myself. And but when I got married, <laughs> yeah, no, I well, I spoke first because my husband actually comes from a different uh, from a different accent, so that's understood. But um, when I got married, um, I told my husband, I love you for the sake of Allah. <laughs> what a love story. That's so romantic. Well, my husband's response was, <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to tell me what kind of a utopian understanding do you have so he just said <laughs> now the details unfortunately when we see the women um, when we see the women because of that distance from the scholars a lot of times they don't get to see that being being a mu'mina does not necessarily mean that you isolate yourself from your, your children, your husband. You, and how do I actually put Islam into practice? And that's, inshallah, we're, we're going to be talking about that in, in just a bit. Inshallah. Again, this is, this is just the... Not the butter yet. Not the butter. This is just... Come on. This is, when are we getting the butter? It's 2 o'clock. Yeah, inshallah, right now. All right. So the other part is when harm and benefit contradict when harm and benefit contradict, we consider, we look at the consider, uh, the consideration is going to be the major effect. Consideration is for the major effect. Like what, what uh, like for example, is there, is there any benefit from selling khamr, liquor? Yes, there is. Right? There's some, there's some financial benefit. Make money. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarded that that benefit, that benefit, is worthless when we look at the amount of harm it brings. Huh? When we look at the amount of harm, amount of harm it brings. The laws of priority in family, your family precedes the community benefit. Look at this. It's flipped. Because generally the community benefit generally comes before the individual benefit. But when it comes to your own family, your family precedes the community benefit. Your focus should be on your family. Your focus should be on your family and not the other way around. <coughs> now we go to the butter. butter. Ready? Okay. Now all this stuff, all this stuff that, I was, uh, that I was talking about were just general laws. Those were kind of like when you're studying the math. And then now we go for the real numbers. All right. The the guidelines for for the how we regard the priorities and all that that you have to keep in mind because we're going to be working it out. But before we start that, I just want you to memorize D N A I D N A I M. This was aqal is supposed to be before Ard. This is a mistake. D N A I M. Yep. D N A S A K L I R D and M E L. This is a mistake in here. All right. So I want you guys to remember that because we're going to be applying that same rule here. Ready? Let's do it. <coughs> 